Hello to everyone uh, and thank you for being here at the University of Liège and remotely um, on the occasion of our face it, the new challenges of cognitive visual semiotics, a facet event symposium. I'm delighted, I'm delighted, I'm delighted to welcome to our symposium our recently elected vice president of the University of Liège, who is from the Faculty of Social Science and an expert of the challenges posed by the digital revolution as regards organizational practices. Thank you so much for being here. And uh... Thank you very much. And um, dear colleagues, uh, mm -hmm. it is an honor for me to welcome you at the University of Liège, of Liège for this symposium facing the new challenges of cognitive visual semiotics. Our university is a so-called complete university. It is composed of 11 faculties covering most of the disciplines usually present in a university. Those 11 faculties are divided into three sectors, life sciences, sciences and technologies, and human and social sciences. One of the characteristics of our alma mater is to promote interdisciplinarity in both research and teaching, even though we know that, this, that it is not always an easy process to promote this inter, interdisciplinarity. You will therefore understand that I was very interested to see in the presentation of the symposium that Maria Giulia uh, gave me, that your symposium was resolutely interdisciplinary. In this sense, the program of the symposium is impressive, both by the richness of the themes and by the diversity of approaches that will be addressed. I would therefore like to congratulate the organizers for having been able to bring together a panel of speakers from different backgrounds, but all interested in the same questions about the meanings of the representation of the face or the visage in the digital era. The digital revolution is profound and its impact until now or in the future are certainly significant. Multiple issues are emerging and semiotics is certainly a discipline that contributes to a better understanding of the phenomenon. From what I know about it, and I specify that I'm not a specialist of semiotics, Semiotics is, in essence, a discipline at the intersection of knowledge coming from several disciplines, such as philosophy, sociology, linguistics, anthropology, but also cognitive sciences. In my opinion, these characteristics make semiotics a discipline that allows for a complex approach of the phenomenon in the sense of a gamme morale. It is obvious that the digital revolution in general, and the one concerning digital human communication in particular, requires an attempt to study its impacts according to the principle of a complex approach. This is why your symposium is so relevant and stimulating. We need new analytical knowledge about the place of the digital communication, and your approach is in this sense very promising. I would like to thank and congratulate the organizers of this symposium because it gives our university the opportunity to see a very nice panel of experts <laughs> present here in Liège. So welcome in Liège, enjoy the symposium, and I wish you a fruitful work. Thank you very much. To begin my, um, my part of introduction, this uh, introduction will be delivered by three voices, those of Massimo, Claudio and me. Before presenting our individual contributions to the research topics of our meeting, I'd like to say a few words about the archaeology of this symposium and explain the reasons why 
The three of us have decided to organize together a scientific encounter of its kind in 2023. First of all, we met a long time ago. Our first encounter having probably taken place before we began our PhDs in semiotics. Each of us has followed and taken part in the scientific progression and career development of the other two. Massimo and I have shared the same interest in the semiotics of art and of the image. And now we share a deep interest in deep fakes and more generally in the tradition of portraiture and in the representation of the face in both the arts and in communication media. The latter being the research object of Massimo's ERC Consolidator Grant facets. Claudio and I have shared the discussions about the epistemological and the methodological turn in semiotics. That is the turn from the text toward the practices paradigm, a turn having occurred around 2004, thanks to the work of Jacques Fontani. And we have more recently engaged in discussions regarding the theory of enunciation, its destiny and its renewed perspectives. Claudio and Massimo have shared a long lasting interest for the debate between the different approaches in semiotics, in particular between the cultural approach, the cognitive approach and the textualist one. This is the first time that these bilateral collaborations have become multilateral. It's the first time that we have organized an event, the three of us together. So why now of all times? Well, for a, for a series of reasons, I'd say that the first one would be our desire to further the state of the art of the semiotics of images, especially as regards its more innovative current approaches, which we hope will lead to a renovation in the analysis of images. Two approaches we find to be of potential benefit to the traditional semiotics of the image. These two approaches are the digital humanities, notably digital art history, and the approaches stemming from the cognitive turn in semiotics. In short, we firstly wish to ponder the benefits semiotics may draw from a collaboration between specialists of the digital humanities and specialists of the computational analysis and automatic production of images. And secondly, the consequences of semiotics of the image that could integrate the question of how we know the world and ourselves through the objects of the world. The second reason is more academic. Massimo Leone is currently visiting professor at the University of Liège at the Centre de Semiotique et Rhetorique, of which I'm part. With Claudio, we decided to organize this symposium in order to take advantage of Massimo's precious presence in Liège and to discuss some of our common research topics. The third reason is that Claudio and I value our collaboration with the extraordinary team of researchers taking part in the ERC Consolidator Grant obtained by Massimo in 2018, which began in 2019. The full title of the ERC project is Facets, Face Aesthetics in Contemporary E-Technological Technological Societies. In fact, this theme is important to both Claudio's research and mine. Claudio investigates the functions of subjectivity in enunciation theory and the problem of big data. While I work on the literature, and on the representation of generalities through images, such as Francis Gelton's composite photographs, which try to represent the general human or a typical identity, in addition to working on deep fakes, which aim to superimpose or substitute individualities. As far as my research on computational analysis is concerned, I should mention that one of the approaches that we value in our uh, innovative project for visual semiotics is obviously, is of course, digital art history. My objectives are numerous, but I'd say that it's special, especially important 
to not only test the possibilities of computational analysis as regards the capacity for discovering analogies between different groups of images, this being a problem that already occupied many researchers over the last years, especially those who promoted the Replica project in Switzerland, as well as pioneer Lev Manovich in the USA, but also to test the instruments for semiotic analysis, such as the plastic analysis of images. As I will uh, later uh, show, plastic analysis, as formulated in semiotics today, is a sophisticated tool which allows the researcher to analyze the rhythms and temporalities that are simulated in a still image. And so the challenge is to make it possible for the machine to analyze the artistic image in all its subtle relations to other groups of images. I will explain this approach in greater detail in a minute. <laughs> After having directed a four-year project on metavisuality and big data collections beginning in 2018, I received from the National Fund for Scientific Research another four-year grant, 2022-2025, entitled Towards a Genealogy of Visual Forms, Semiotic and Computer-Assisted Approaches to Large Image Collections. This project focuses on the relation between contemporary approaches in image processing and the genealogy of visual forms in art, in art history, as conceived of by Abby Warburg, I refer to the Atlas Mnemosine, and by Henri Fossillon, I refer to the life of forms in art. These two approaches in art history have to be confronted with the semiotic tradition of the plastic analysis of images and with the propositions I presented in my last book, The Language of Images, the Forms and the Forces, published in two, uh, 2012 and 20, um, which addresses my conception of forms and forces in images. The solutions I'd like to offer by this project, and solutions that have to be implemented yet, are based on a method of image segmentation that underlies a wider philosophical reflection to computer vision, with the objective of making continuous bodily gestures and poses analyzable in large collections of paintings and photographs, especially facial photography, which puts the body at the center of the attention. This method finds its roots in the French school of semiotics, especially in the intensive semiotics developed by Jacques Fontany and Claude Zilberberg. I refer to the book Tension and Meaning, Tension et Signification, 1998, as well as in Gilles Deleuze's work on pictorial diagrams made of forces. I refer to the logic of sensation on Bacon's diagrammatical painting. And in René Tom's idea, of conflicting forces in painting. Italians will know that I refer to the book Morphologia del Semiotico, Morphology of Semiotics, which groups two papers on mathematics and rhythms in pictorial art, works of art. They all argue, Fontani, uh, Deleuze, uh, René Tom, they all argue that the image is not a matter of the representation of recognizable isolated objects, but rather a matter of relations and oppositions between differences and similarities present within the surface of an image. The theoretical basis of this approach is the structuralism and post-structuralism developed in France since the 60s, and which investigates how meaning is generated by differences. In the post-structuralism period, the differences have been studied not only as binary categorial oppositions, but also as graduated modulations. This is the conception offered by tensive semiotics, a development of structuralism in the 90s and 2000s, which also contributed to my reflection on forms as a kind of stabilization of opposing forces in images. 
In Gray-Mastian plastic, uh, plastic semiotics, the three plastic categories, topological, eidetic, and chromatic, are put in action in image analysis using the structuralist principle of oppositions, upper versus lower, left versus right, enclosing form versus enclosed form, and so on. Intensive semiotics, we analyze the meaning of the intensity graduation in a categorical scale. That is, for instance, from upper to lower light intensity, from a right situated saturated color to a left situated unsaturated color, from a light concentration to an intensive shadow, etc. Through the oppositions and the graduated scale located on the plane of expression of images, the analyst is able to study every image neither as an average of features nor as an accumulation of isolatable objects, but as a singular, or as a singular object made of tensions between opposing characteristics and opposing directions. Moreover, these oppositions are arranged according to a certain temporality. We can study the rhythm according to which these passages between a concentration of light and an extensive shadow occur. Do they take place all at once, slowly, promptly? Examples of plastic oppositions can be seen in two paintings. Tintoretto, Starkin and Lucrezia, and Artemisia Gentileschi's Judith slaying all of hands. The first case uh, shows the oppositions between forces of elevation. Lucrezia's body is uh, suspended and pulled upwards by Tarquinio, and forces of fall. The pearls of the, necla of the necklace are falling down, as are the small sculpture in the right in the right uh, side of the painting and the pillow as well. In the second image, Olofens is dying, but continuing to struggle with Judith and the servant who are trying to immobilize and be hid him. The conflictual forces in opposite gestures and directions are clearly visible. But how could the machine be able to consider these elements that are fundamental in the appreciation of works of art? In my view, computer vision misses the differences between various images statuses and continues to argue that it's possible to use the same instruments to analyze scientific, artistic, political, and advertising images. In this sense, it would be important to have databases composed only of artistic images chosen through their relations in terms of forces. For instance, a still life of flowers can be labeled as being very close to a stormy landscape because of the forces of the vortex present in both images. Until today, images have been measured based on their feature averages. Everyone knows this, this kind of visualization of feature averages in images. Uh, these features are color saturation, uh, or uh, there is another way to uh, visualize um, similarities. It's the case of iconographic motifs as uh, uh, does uh, uh, repli the replica project. What is important to do is to define a different kind of automatic segmentation of images. One that could make it possible to study, to study images according to their composition dynamics and according to the forces they engage. What do I mean proposing an image segmentation by the dynamics of a forces within a still image? The forces can partly be identified with directionality. The direction of a glance, of a raised hand, of a pointed finger, but also with the directions given by components of the image, we are, which are not figurative but formal plastic. The change of the luminosity within a painting works as a kind of arrow. The change in saturation is able to produce a force of, ele of elevation or of a fall. The geometry of a gesture also counts. 
A gesture composing a circular figure on the plane of expression reflects stability and calmness on the plane of content. On the contrary, a gesture composing an irregular triangle will reflect disrupting directions, a conflict on the plane of content. Let's uh, uh, look at a painting by Tintoretto, which exhibits this kind of dynamic uh, composition. There are at least three forces at work, uh, which may be identified in Susanna and the elders of Tintoretto. First, the direction of the gazes of the elders spying on beautiful Susanna while she bats. See the red arrows drawn in the painting. Two, the gaze of Susanna, who shields herself from view by focusing on the mirror and on the water mirror, introspection mm -hmm. devices in painting and in cinema. See the blue arrows that are directed towards these devices of introspection. Suzanne is concentrated on the two images of herself, and she's not aware of the elders spying on her. Three, she positions herself between the trees and the edge, which function as protective and closing devices. See the pale blue arrows which are enclosing Suzanne and detaching her from the local environment. We face two opposing models of observing. The simulacrum of our own spectatorial gaze, oriented upon Susanna's body, the latter being nude, illuminated, and frontally exposed inside of the perspective device, in green in the painting, and the model of gazing proposed by the elders as indiscreet onlookers who are a priori excluded from the spectacle of female nudity. How is one to assume a position given the multiplication of the points of observation to be fulfilled? Which gaze is correct? Which one is the, is the most legitimate? We have to stress the fact that in, pain, in the painting, Suzanne is neither aware of the spire's eyes nor of our gaze. Does this make us spires as well? This case is crucial to make explicit the complexity of each work of art in terms of content, in, in terms of ethics, but also in what concerns the presence of conflictual forces and the position of the bodies within the landscape. Before giving the floor to Massimo and Claudio, I'd like to return to computer vision and to the fundamental partition that it makes between figure and background. As Fossillon stated in his seminal book, The Life of Forms in Art, the background participates in the system of forces and contrasting directions inside the frame and takes part in the ecological organization of every artwork. In a painting, the figure and the background are always coupled, according to Fossillon. The landscape can be a response to the figure, a consequence or a determination of the figure, or a place where the figure can diffuse itself to the point of dispersion or of disappearance. Think of the landscape of Nicolas Poussin, for instance. As you can see um, in this uh, image, uh, sorry. Mm. As you can see in this image obtained using open pose uh, algorithms, even the instruments dedicated to the study of gestures are not adequate, either, neither to discover the forces within the body of the figure, nor to discover the relation between the bodies and the objects in the environment. In fact, the bodies are not analyzed as articulated complexes, but only as skeletons. It is important to note as well that here the statue is not considered as a body by the algorithm and that these algorithms do not take the background into account, which is obviously a default. Represented gestures, poses and movements are not isolated elements in the image. On the contrary, they spread, propagate and circulate across the image's background as active forces. It's not really better what Impet and Moretti um, did in 2017 in order to formalize the gestures of the bodies found in Warburg's Atlas Nemosin panels. The attempt is anyway remarkable, 
because it tries to measure and compare the movement of bodies represented in various images in the Atlas Mnemosyne. In order to arrive at the formal descriptions of pathos formal, the forms of pathos in gestures. My critical remark regarding this method is that its modeling reduces the body to a skeleton, a geometric figure made of line segments, whereas the body has a volume which occupies the space and a silhouette which is involved in every gestural dynamics and plays a crucial role in directionality. The body represented in, a, in an image cannot be analyzed as a mere sum of individual body parts, spine, arms, legs, head, etc., but rather as a silhouette made of internal forces in movement within a landscape. Leonard Impet, in a two, mm, 2020 paper published in the Routledge Companion to Digital Humanities and Art History, entitled Analyzing Gesture in Digital Art History, tries to complexify the model of the body by inserting the parameters of directionality and the rhythm of moving, as you can see in this schema. This is an innovative diagrammatization of the body that makes us optimistic, thanks, um, at least as regards the modalization of gestures. What we can hope for the future of digital art history is the possibility of enriching the parameters that make a work of art a work of art not only the specificity and the refinement of each composition, but also and notably the genealogy of similar or dissimilar schematizations of forms which make art history a multi-layered history of crossed inspirations and influences, corrections, competitions, and negation of choices and attempts made by other paintings and photographers in an ongoing struggle for the broadest possible experimentation with spatiality, with the dialogue between forms and the observer's body, as well as experimentation with the conception of art and with the broadening of our capacity to imagine. Thank you so much.